So many hands to, uh, to greet. We're so glad that you came today to Faithway Baptist Church. Thank you for being here. Our purpose of joining together on the first day of the week is to worship the Lord. And I hope that as uh, the word is preached and the fellowship and all that transpires, that you'll get a blessing and that you'll grow in your Christ likeness. That's the purpose that your worship would be authentic and it would be real. And it'd be real and directed, of course, to the Lord. So let's open up in a word of prayer. Father, thank you now for Jesus Christ. Thank you for your son who came and died on the cross for us so that we could have life and life abundantly. Thank you for the provision of the death and the burial and the resurrection of Jesus Christ so that we can be uh, born again, that we can know you as our personal Savior. So, Father, thank you for what you're doing. Bless and encourage us, we pray in Christ's name. Amen. All righty, we are uh, here. Uh, we have a couple of visitors today, and we uh, have a verse of the month, or two verses for each month. Our goal is to hide God's word in our heart. And uh, so we, uh, we go over it on Sunday, but we're hoping during the week that you'll take this verse home and you will memorize it, commit it to memory, uh, meditate upon it, and let God use it in your life to encourage you and to help you in your walk with Christ. So, together we'll say it. Are you ready? Galatians 5, 22 and 23. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance, Against such there is no law. Galatians 5, 22 and 23. Aren't you glad you don't need to work on any of those? <laughs> all right, let's all stand together this morning. Good to see you. Thank you for being here. Let's all sing song number 495, Jesus Loves Even Me. What an encouraging truth. Jesus Loves Even Me. I am so glad that our Father in heaven tells of his love in the book he has given. Wonderful things in the Bible I see. This is the dearest that Jesus loves me. I am so glad that Jesus loves me. Jesus loves me. Jesus loves me. I am so glad that Jesus loves me. Jesus loves even me. Though I forget him and wander away, still he doth love me wherever I stray. Back to his dear loving arms would I flee when I remember that Jesus loves me. I am so glad that Jesus loves me. Jesus loves me. Jesus loves me. I am so glad that Jesus loves me. Jesus loves me. Oh, if there's only one song I can sing, when in his beauty I see the great King, this shall my song in eternity be. Oh, what a wonder that Jesus loves me. I am so glad that Jesus loves me. Jesus loves me. Jesus loves me. I am so glad that Jesus loves me. Jesus loves even me. Singing thing. Let's continue singing song number 79. Song number 79 um, in the celebration hymnal, My Jesus, I Love Thee. We love him because he first loved us. Let's sing it out. Song 79. My Jesus, I love thee. I know thou art mine. Oh, 
This morning's scripture reading is going to be the first book of Timothy, chapter 1. If you all turn your Bibles there and follow along. <clears throat> Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ, by the commandment of God our Savior and Lord Jesus Christ, which is our hope. Unto Timothy, my son, in the faith, grace, mercy, and peace from God our Father and Jesus Christ our Lord. As I besought thee to abide still at Ephesus, when I went into Macedonia, that thou mightest charge some that they teach no other doctrine. Neither give heed to fables and endless genealogies, which minister questions, rather godly edifying, which is in faith, so do. Now the end of the commandment is charity, out of pure heart and of good conscience and faith unfeigned. From some having swerved, having turned aside unto vain jangling, desiring to be teachers of the law, understanding neither what they say, not whereof they affirm. But we know the law is good if men use it lawfully, knowing that the law is not made for righteousness man, for righteous man, but for lawless and disobedient, for the ungodly and for sinners, for unholy, profane, for murders of fathers and murders of mothers, for manslayers, for whoremongers, for them that defile themselves with mankind, for men stealer, for liars, for perjured persons, if there be any other thing that is contrary to sound doctrine, according to the glorious gospel of the blessed God, which was committed to my trust. And I thank Christ Jesus, our Lord, who hath enabled me, for he counteth me faithful, putting me into the ministry, who was before a blasphemer and a persecutor and injurious, but I obtained mercy because I did ignorantly in unbelief. And the grace of our Lord was exceedingly abundant with faith and love, which is in Christ Jesus. This is a faith, and this is faithful saying and worthy of all acceptance that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of who I am chief. Howbeit for this cause I obtain mercy that in me first Jesus Christ might show forth all long suffering for a pattern to them which should hereafter believe of him to life everlasting. Now unto the King eternal, immortal, invisible, the only wise God, be honor and glory forever and ever. Amen. This charge I commit unto thee, son Timothy, according to the prophecies which went before on thee, that thou by them mightest war a good warfare, holding faith and a good conscience, which some have put away concerning faith, have made shipwreck, of whom is Hymenus and Alexander, who I have delivered unto Satan, that they may learn not to blaspheme. All righty. Well, we're going to do something a little bit different today. And uh, uh, first of all, I'd like to just uh, thank our visitors that are here today. I hope you get a chance to get to know them. Um, uh, James, I actually met uh, about a year and a half ago here at the church for a little bit. But I just wanted to say that um, uh, when I found out that James uh, works down at Pacific Guard Mission, how many of you are familiar with Pacific Guard Mission? What a lighthouse. What a history that that has. How many of you are familiar with Unshackle? Anybody familiar with Unshackle? It is a broadcast where they take someone's life and they display it, but it's done in old-time radio. So my wife and I have been down there for the um, 
for those filmings of it or the recordings of it. And so when they, it's just like it used to be uh, before most of you were born, including me, good thing, 40s and 30s, was that uh, when they would like have someone come in walking in, somebody would pick up the shoes and start banging them on the wood as they're walking through. And it's all the organ playing. But what's really neat about it is the story of redemption. And uh, when I was traveling um, in the business world, I would be down in the city two to three days a week. I would take the train down. That's where an area of sales that I had. And I would um, go over to the old lighthouse there on State Street and have lunch, listen to the testimonies of some of the men there, and, and then partake in the service there, listen to the message. And I remember the men, I was on the men's side, when the men would get up, one of the first things almost all of them said when they got up because of their lifestyle and what was taking place in their life, whether they were saved or unsaved, they would stand up and they'd say this right away. They would say, um, thank you, Lord, for allowing me to live today. Because they never knew because of their lifestyle and being on the streets what tomorrow would bring. But they were glad, excuse me, glad that they were alive. And I got to meet some very interesting characters. And I was able to meet one gentleman named Kermit. That's a strange name, isn't it? about six foot five. He was found in the house next door with a needle hanging out of his arm. And they rescued him, brought him over to Pacific Garden Mission through their program there and their careful discipleship and their preaching of the gospel. He came to know Christ as a savior and grew and grew and grew and ended up working there for years, helping others then. What a tremendous testimony to the old lighthouse. And so, um, in fact, if you know much about Billy Sunday, that was where uh, he came to know Christ, right outside of the old mission when he was uh, back in the 1800s. So it's a kind of neat testimony about his life, too. And Sheree is here, too, but we're going to find out more about her in just a moment. But um, I wanted to take your Bibles and go to Isaiah chapter 12. Uh, we don't do this normally, but i just like to talk about the importance of, of not only sharing your faith, but growing in faith and being committed to that faith. Oh, probably a couple years ago now, um, Carmine and Shanna uh, brought a visitor to uh, Faithway Baptist Church. It was Tori, and we were so glad uh, to meet Tori. And, um, oh, I would say probably after about a month or two, I remember it as clear as day, uh, Tori walking up this side of the auditorium, and I met her halfway there, and she said, we need to talk. And if anybody knows Tori, that means we need to talk. And so uh, my wife and I were able to go back and uh, saw her come to know Christ as her Savior, Danny, uh, months later. But may I say that um, it was a church-wide effort of people pouring their lives into others. Many people prayed. Many people talked to them. Danny came to a couple of the Bible studies. I mean, there was a lot in that life. And I want to share this with you and then get to where we're getting to. Isaiah chapter 12, verse number 2, 3, 4, 5, and 6. I want to share these verses with you. I sent them out this morning because they were on my mind. So I hear you're wrestling those pages. And so most of you seem to be there now. It says, Behold, God is my salvation. I will trust and not be afraid, for the Lord Jehovah is my strength and my song. He also has become my salvation. Therefore, joy shall ye draw water out of the well of salvation. And in that day shall you praise the Lord, call upon his name, declare his doings among the people, and make mention that his name is exalted. Sing unto the Lord, for he hath done excellent things. This is known in all the earth. Cry out and shout, uh, thou inhabitants of Zion, for great is the Holy One of Israel in the midst of thee. So give thanks. Proclaim his goodness. Make known his salvation. Declare his gospel. Sing of his attributes. And so uh, Tori approached me a while ago, and Danny, this is a few months ago, maybe you can't remember exactly when, and we, we, we didn't get it accomplished, and then we talked again. And that was, the uh, Lord has changed their lives. Aren't you glad that God just doesn't save, but then he changes? Those of you here that know Jesus Christ is your Savior, you know that God changed you. Not only did he save you, but he's working in your life, and he's changing you into the image of Christ. 
And Tori said it was important to her and Danny that they wanted to let the church know, of course, that they are saved, but also that they are dedicating their whole family to the faith. They want to make sure that they grow up in Christ, and that's important to them. So we're kind of doing a little bit of a dedication of the family here. As, as she speaks, she's going to say a couple things. She says she was nervous, but I think she'll do just fine. And, um, and, uh, and the kids, and um, through the junior church and Tim's efforts of uh, planting the seed, uh, their two oldest children have come to Christ. And what a joy that is that there are new names written down in glory. Now, one day, uh, we're going to baptize them all at the same time. And isn't that going to be special when the whole family gets baptized together? How, how, how neat is that, that we get to have a small part of their life? So the family's going to come up here, and they are just really what we're doing here. This is, does not save anybody. Uh, they're saved through the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. We have just been able to enter into their lives, and so they're just stating here how important it is, this faith, and that they want to make sure, even if for some reason they were not here, that they have a good friend that would uh, raise them in the faith so they would be instructed of Jesus Christ and his ways. And then we'll pray, and uh, we have a part of their life. We get to invest in their family. How cool is that? You can have them over to your house. You can go to their home. You can learn of them, and we can enter into one another's life. What a precious time this is for our church because we don't want it to be us four and no more. We want to reach the whole community for Christ, don't we? And see people constantly coming here. and have, I, I, There's 13 people here today that uh, I counted up, children and, and, and people that were reached through this ministry. That is really, that's really the work of the Lord. So Tori and Danny... Danny's become precious to me as well. Why don't you guys come on up here? Kids can come if they want to, too. And, and then we'll pray together as a, as a church. <laughs> if I'm going there, go on. Uh, you lose on that one. <laughs> All right. Here we go. Okay. Do I need the mic on? Well, I'll probably put it in here. Okay. I'm not a public speaker at all. He, he, this, he tricked me into this. <laughs> okay, be quiet. Um, most of you at this point have met me and us, and whether that's good or bad, I don't know. Um, but when I grew up, I was in church. I said my prayers. I fell asleep in the pew. I didn't have the education, the guidance, or the encouragement to really know Christ or the pathway that I wanted to take in life. Um, there was a point in time where I was a little bit rebellious and kind of gave up on that as well because just, you know, people got into my head. Um, it wasn't really until I had Verlaine that I started going to church regularly and wanted to create that relationship, but I still didn't know how. Um, that's where Sheree comes in. I've known her for 15 years, and I've always said she is like a guardian angel sent to me here to kind of keep me on the right track. She has an amazing relationship with God, and I wanted something like that. So she taught me what that looked like, and then Shannon and Carm brought me here, and Unfortunately for all of you, you're stuck with this <laughs> because it's been amazing. And the things that have changed in our life, Pastor and Nancy and every single person here in some way or another has helped us, prayed for us, taught us how to build our own relationship with God. And even more so my kids. They absolutely love junior church like Pastor mentioned. They're thriving in it. Um, they won all the ribbons at NBT. Um, so they come home and they sing the songs and they're talking to people. They literally were in an argument yesterday at a party about Jesus and what he does for people. So they are already so much further ahead than even we are now, I think, at this point. And that's probably the biggest blessing. So I am very thankful that God brought me here with the, all of you. And I'm very thankful that you all took the time to invest in us as well and, and welcomed us into the family. This is... Um, more than I would have ever imagined or asked for. <laughs> None of that was what I had planned. <laughs> yes, uh, uh, exactly. You know, we, we, we grow here as a family. Um, and not to make it too long, but I grew up Catholic, so it was just you go to church, you say your prayers, you come back, and you keep praying, but you don't. I didn't really understand why. And I was more rebellious in that part where I did anything and everything I wanted. But here, I've learned to build the relationship with God to understand and know why we're saved. And that's something that, like my wife said, 
they're much further than we are because they're starting so young. You know, we had to do it our way and find the right way. And we're growing together, so that's, that's really big for me. Um, and uh, yes, definitely feel at home with everybody here helping us grow together, so we're very thankful. Would I like to go, because Sheree, you have such a big part of their family. If you'd like to come up here, you can. We're going to pray. Tim, why don't you come up here? We're just going to pray. And, you know, we have a responsibility as a church, don't we, to invest in others, too. And so as uh, we see this family grow, we get to be a part of it. And each one of your families here, there's testimonies after testimonies. So I'll pray, and then, Tim, you can close, okay? All right. Well, Father, we're so thankful for the Lord Jesus Christ. Thank you for the immediacy of salvation. And then the change it puts into our lives. Thank you for the Gonzalez family. Thank you for their love for you. Thank you for their testimony. Thank you for their great growth in you. Thank you for there's countless people here in this church that had part of, 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 of seeing you both come to Christ. And Father, thank you for our church who just reached out to them and prayed for them and befriended them and called them and talked to them and Thank you for Janet Gray and all that she did as well. Just thank you so much for your goodness and grace. So, Father, we just once again just um, repeat what this family wants to do. We just dedicate them to you and uh, that their children would grow up in the knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. Thank you for the two that have been saved. And, Father, we pray for Lexi to come to the knowledge of you as well. Now, bless and encourage this family. Give uh, Danny and Tori strength. Give them encouragement. Give them knowledge. Help them to grow in their Christ-likeness. And then, Father, also we pray uh, that they would uh, uh, raise their family as a godly seed and a testimony unto the grace that they've already experienced. Father, thank you for that. Tim. Father, thank you so much for the impact our church has been able to have on their lives. Thank you so much for the people in their lives, as Pastor prayed, that have encouraged and have a challenge and exhorted them. And Lord, I just pray that you would help us to continue to be um, a family, Lord, just a, a, a great community to them. I, I pray for their family. I pray for Tori and Danny as they raise their children, that they would do so uh, in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. Father, I, I pray that you would give the wisdom that's needed. I pray that you would help us as a church to be be um, that friendly, encouraging, and, and come alongside uh, family. Father, I just pray you'd help us to be what we can to them and just to help them in any way that we can. We love you, Savior, in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 You know, and the reason for that is because the Lord saved them and, and they responded to the gospel. And it's such a wonderful thing, redemption and Christ's work and how that's applied to us. We're going to sing that out in our final hymn, His Robes for Mine, that Christ's righteousness was exchanged for our unrighteousness and that he took our place and he died on the cross for us. And that's why we sing. We're going to sing the first two verses in the chorus and then the final two verses in the chorus. But as we sing, think about those words and what Christ did for you. Or what if he hasn't done it for you yet, or what he can do for you. Let's all stand together this morning, and we're going to sing His Robes for Mine, our hymn of the month. His robes for mine, oh wonderful exchange. Clothed in my sin, Christ suffered neath God's rain. I live, for in my place he died. His robes for mine, what cause have I for dread? God's daunting law, Christ mastered in my stead. Faultless I stand, with righteous works not mine. Saved by my Lord's, by 
precarious death and life. I cling to Christ and marvel at the cost. Jesus forsaken, God is strange from God. But by such love, my life is not my own. My praise, my all, shall be for Christ. Justice is a peace. Jesus is crushed, and thus the Father's please. Christ drank God's wrath on sin, then cried, "Tis done. Sin's wages paid, propitiation won. His robes for mine, such anguish none can know. Christ God's beloved." Damned as though his foe, he as though I a curse and left alone. I as though he embraced and welcomed home. I cling to Christ and marvel at the cost. Jesus forsaken, God is strange from God, but by such love. Praise my all shall be for Christ alone. Great singing, thank you. You may be seated. And does it not point to the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ in such a clear and plain way. Well, at this time, uh, uh, Tim is going to move towards the back, and uh, we have junior church, so the kids can make their way to go to the back. There will be a lot of yelling, screaming, and Bible learning in that order. <laughs> now, can I ask you something? When I say, come on, let's go to church, nobody runs in here and says, yay! <laughs> Well, he gives out candy. I guess maybe that's why. If you sit up nice, straight, and tall, I'll throw a tootsie roll. All right. Well, we have been going through the book of 1 John, so if you're visiting today, you are catching us already at the end of chapter number 4 of 1 John. And we have been looking as John is carefully... Uh, 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 in love, is, is, is giving principles and tests about how to know that you are in the household of faith so that you can have that assurance of salvation. God did not create us to be in a position of always in slavish fear of judgments to come and slavish fear of when doubt knocks that we're not sure if we're born again or not. And so um, John has been going through this, and now he begins to almost rehash or re-say what he said before. And the reason that that is is because all of us learn in different ways and in different conversations. And so John repeats to, for those that already got it, and you say, man, I got it, I know it. He, he explains it a different way just to help it to go maybe a little deeper. Maybe he'll add something you had not thought about before. Or maybe for some of us, like I know when I first got saved, everything was foreign. I mean, just, just the, even the, the book of Job, I didn't know it was Job until someone told me. I mean, I had no knowledge of the scriptures at all, and so I had to hear it over and over. And can I tell you, in studying this, I realized how much I did not know, though I thought I knew. And so it is good for us today to look a little bit deeper. So let's look at our text. That'd be 1 John chapter 4. Now we've covered the first um, two principles. And I don't think because we took a little bit longer of something that was so needful, so wonderful, and so sweet, but we might not get all of the principles covered today, but we'll go as far as we can. But I'll read the whole text. So that's 1 John chapter 4, starting in verse number 12. No man have seen God at any time. If we love one another, God dwelleth in us, and his love is perfected in us. Hereby know 
we that we dwell in him and he in us because he hath given us his spirit. And we have seen and do testify that the Father sent the Son to be the Savior of the world. Whosoever shall confess that Jesus is the Son of God, God dwelleth in him and he in God. And, and we have known and believe the love that God hath to us. God is love, and he that dwelleth in love dwelleth in God, and God in him. Herein is our love made perfect, that we may have boldness in the day of judgment, because as he is, so are we in this world. There is no fear in love, but perfect love casteth out fear, because fear hath torment. He that feareth is not made perfect in love. That fear he's talking about there because torments attached to it is that slavish wrong fear. That fear that Satan gives. That, that fear of losing. The fear that God doesn't love us because there is a good fear. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. The fear of the Lord is a proper fear and a good fear. But he's talking about an evil fear here. We love him. Because he first loved us. If a man say, I love God, and hateth his brother, he is a liar. For he that loveth not his brother, whom he hath seen, how can he love God, whom he have not seen? And this commandment have we from him, that he who loveth God love his brother also. Father, thank you now as we begin to uh, focus our minds on the word for word scripture. Thank you that the way it is laid out in the, in the Bible, in your holy word, it is perfect for us to understand. So we do pray, those of us that are born again, we have the Holy Spirit that lives within us, that he would illuminate and teach and show us all that we need to know about him. Thank you for your goodness. Thank you for your grace. Thank you that you're still saving souls. Thank you that we can still grow in Christ's likeness. Father, we live in a world that has gone crazy. We live in a world that has cast you out, but yet we know that when it gets dark, the grace of the gospel is brighter than ever. And so we pray if there be someone here today that does not know you, they've never come to union with you, they've never been born again, that even today they would be saved and they would know that they have a relationship with you. Father, thank you for the clarity of the scriptures. Help us to learn today. Help us to change, change our church. Change us, we pray in Christ's name, amen. So John reminds us of the confidence we can have in this life if you practice Christian love. Christian love is not the only attribute of God. If all we do is preach love, 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 we would not be able to, to, to really give the fullness of God's hesed love. He's just, he's righteous, he's pure, he's separated. Uh, uh, all these things are part his holy all these things are but, but John is, is, is drawing to uh, in, this, in this text and in the context that we're learning is how important love is the practice Christian love God's love abiding in the believer promotes the consciousness of reciprocal love this type of love often produces confidence in the view of the future and this love from the father diminishes and it will eventually cast out all slavish fear the more we understand that love from God, it's no longer a religion, but a relationship. God demonstrated, God gave, he loves, he loves unconditionally. And after we're saved, as we begin to walk in the light, as he's in the light and we experience that love and we see that God is for us and he wants the best for us, we see that love and we can't but love him back in the right way. It's not a slavish type of fear anymore because perfect love casts out what? Fear. John outlines for us five principles in the remaining of this chapter four for us to learn. And once we learn them, we must put them into our hearts through memorization and meditation and then apply these principles to our daily walk. Not only do we have to understand them, not only do we have to believe them, but then we have to practice them, put them into our daily walk. So the experiential of our Christianity is real as well. As we have said, God does not leave his people in a quagmire of uncertainty. God desires that each of his children would be sure of his eternal security. God wants his believing children to have a relationship of restful assurance in him. 
How can you live the Christian walk if you're in constant fear that you're not right with God in the sense of salvation? And some people do that. They add to, the, they add to salvation. They put laws and, and principles that should not be there. And so John says, no, no, no. That's what the Gnostics were doing. That's what was happening in this young church. These, 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 um, these, these false teachers crept in and they made salvation complicated. They added to it. And so they didn't, or were confused. So John, John carefully presents in his letter to all believers God's reassurance of the assurance of salvation. Our life is secure in Christ and we will continue to grow in assurance as we build upon what God continues to do in and through us through the new birth. Because we have the Holy Spirit, as we looked at as principle number one, that, that is in us, he's able to teach us and guide us and illuminate the scriptures so that we can understand it. John is saying it's a combination of all these principles working together like a threefold cord that's not easily broken, it says in Ecclesiastes, to assure us. These truths work together to guide us and give us the confidence we need. And the principles, these five principles, are the indwelling of the Holy Spirit upon redemption. The Holy Spirit moved in and he began to work on you to change you into the image of Christ. He began to give you trials out of love to change your heart, to change those dross, that, 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 that part of your faith that, was, uh, that needed certain things to be removed from it to make it more authentic. And then we learned that the surety of the apostolic writings and eyewitnesses that was last week, and now this week we'll look at probably the third and maybe the fourth, maybe not. Principle we'll consider this morning, the personal confession of Jesus Christ is one of those principles. Experiencing God's love is another one of those principles, and the last one is the practice of God's love. So our third principle is the personal confession of Jesus Christ. Let's look at our text. In 1 John chapter 4, verse number 15, Whosoever shall confess that Jesus is the Son of God, God dwelleth in him, and, and, and he in God. John is being very plain to us, uh, to us. He is saying that if you by grace believe exclusively in Jesus Christ for salvation, he alone is the object of your hope. It's no split trust. You're not trusting in your works and Christ. You're not trusting in, 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 in your wealth. You're not trusting in, in whatever it might be, your church membership. But you are trusting in Christ alone, completely in him. He is saying, that, um, he is saying in there, and you're, all your hope is in him, and your foundation is in him, and all your righteousness is his imputed righteousness, not yours. The great exchange. There's not a stitch of your own efforts or your own abilities, or your own goodness. Then as we have learned that the Holy Spirit indwells you as promised by God, so, whoever, so whosoever shall confess that Jesus is the Son of God, God dwells in him. So if you're born again, depending on him alone, the death, the burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sin, then he dwells in you. God dwells in you, and you in him. John is saying the same truth Paul is saying back in Romans chapter number 10, that the confession of our mouth reflects the wholehearted confession of our soul is an integral part of our salvation. Now, as I read this verse, let me just tell you something, that it is not talking about that if you don't repeat a set prayer out loud when you get saved, you're not saved. That's not what he's saying. Because when I got saved, I was all by myself, and I remembered I just prayed in my mind. I didn't even know what to pray. I'm sure it was theologically all backwards. But whatever it was, it was from a true heart. And God, of course, saved me at that moment. What he's talking about here, about your, the confession from your mouth, is that in your daily life, you are confessing Christ to other people. Hey, Christ changed me. What you see in me is not because of what I did, but because of the cross. And so you are vocal on that over time. The Bible tells us in Romans 10.9 and 10.10 and 10.11, it says this, that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and shalt believe in thy heart that God had raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness and with the mouth 
Confession is made unto salvation. So it's not lip service we're looking for. For the scripture saith, whosoever believeth on him shall not be ashamed. That's what it's talking about there in the scripture is that now that we are saved, we're not ashamed that Christ is in our life. Maybe you're called a Bible thumper or a Jesus freak or whatever those terms were. You're, you're excited that, that Christ has forgiven your sins and that you have a relationship with God and that when you die one day, you're going to spend eternity in heaven. Now that, listen to that, they, she's uncontrollable with hallelujah. Well, it's her first time in the nursery. <laughs> so, um, so um, let me see where I was at here, sorry. So John doesn't have to mind a mere confession of our lips, which many people abuse. This, this text, they confuse lip service without saving faith. But of course, John knows his audience has faced much persecution for their faith in Christ. It was no small thing back in that day to confess Christ. When you confess Christ back in that day, you were excommunicated. You might have lost your employment. You might have been under severe persecution. If you, deny, um, if you tell people you're saved today, your life doesn't change. Now, they might not be happy with you. They might say something. But, but, but it's not like it was in that day. It's no small thing to confess with your mouth in the midst of persecution uh, for these believers. John is speaking about confession that will risk their life. I know a missionary, and some of you in here, when I mention his name, you're going to know him too. His name is Forrest McPhail. How many of you remember Forrest McPhail? Sure. He's a missionary over in the Cambodia area. He's been there for years now. And uh, he was one time sitting down talking to me, and I really appreciated him sharing to me what it was like to live in a country where Jesus Christ is nothing. In fact, you better not trust Christ as your Savior. And he told me this is how they go and witness. Now, could you imagine going to a door here or meeting a family and saying this to him first? Now, listen, um, I'm going to tell you about Jesus Christ. Now, if you receive Christ, you're going to be persecuted. So if I came to you and said, hey, hey uh, Pete, um, listen, if you, if you receive Christ, you're going to be persecuted, you're going to lose your job, your family might even kick you out, and if you get baptized, you might even lose your own life. Would you like to hear about that? And he says that's what they have to almost say ahead of time because of the persecution. And so that's what John's saying here is that, that these believers back in that day, that's what they were facing. So when they claimed Christ, they meant it. Today, it can be lip service. We see that all the time. There's many people here. They don't know the same Jesus I know. They know a Jesus, but it isn't the Jesus that I find in the scriptures. And so, um, so what he's saying here is it's not lip service. Today, it's fashionable. Guess what? It's almost time for elections. There's going to be a lot of baby kissing. Politicians around this time will cater to the religious crowd. We already see it now. A trained parrot can say, I believe Jesus is the Son of God. But who cares? We're not looking for that. Of course, it must come from the inner, from the inner word changed by the work of the indwelling Holy Spirit. So it isn't what you say. It's the work that God is doing inside to change you, and you see that in your life. To, to confess Jesus is to stand up for his name. It is to defend his cause in all times, in all places, before all persons, in all circumstances, to trust him, to obey him, and to surrender under his authority, his loving authority, and to yield to the work of the Holy Spirit in our lives. Take your Bibles, if you will. We're not going to move around a lot, but we are going to move to 2 Corinthians. If you'll, if you'll take your Bibles, move to 2 Corinthians. This was brought up in Sunday school today. This, um, not this verse, but, but um, I think Donna brought it up a little bit. And that is uh, 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 2 Corinthians 3.18. So he was telling these believers, listen, if there's been a great change in your life, that is a security or an assurance that you are born again. If there's been a change in your life uh, by the working of the Spirit, that tells us no matter what anybody else says, that we are born again. So if you look at 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 18, it says this. It says, but we all, 
with open faces, talking to believers, behold, as in a glass, the glory of the Lord. So, so what, he's, what he's saying here is that uh, glass, they didn't have mirrors then. Uh, they're talking about a mirror, looking in a mirror, uh, in, in God's word, that, that the scriptures are his word. They're like a mirror into our heart are changed into the same image from glory to glory, even by the Spirit of the Lord. In other words, our outward appearance doesn't change in the sense that we look like Jesus Christ in a picture. It's talking about from within, God is changing and removing those things that you ought not to do anymore, and He's changing you into the image of His Son, Jesus Christ. That's the difference here. He is getting rid of those, those things that we did before we were saved that God says, no, 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 no more. And he, he changes you at the right speed and the right way, not to hurt you, but for you to understand. Sometimes that's a little slow in process. Sometimes it's quicker. But if we go past 318 now and we look at chapter number 4, you know, chapter division, sometimes we think the thought is over, but the thought is not over because he says in chapter 4, Therefore, seeing we have this ministry, as we receive mercy, we faint not, but have renounced the hidden things of dishonesty. dishonesty. So before where we maybe used to always lie or stretch the truth or we were dishonest, the Holy Spirit is changing us into Christ-likeness where we tell the truth now and we're honest with one another and we don't steal anymore and we're not walking in craftiness nor handling the word of God deceitfully, but manifestation of the truth, commending ourselves to every man's conscience in the sight of God. So now all of a sudden the things of God are important. Where before, they weren't all that important to me. They, they didn't make a big deal. But John said, if you're born again and you dwell in God, then this is what happens. The Holy Spirit changes you into the image of His Son, Jesus Christ. Has that been your experience? That God is changing you and continues to change you? And then the second, or the, the, the fifth prince, or the fourth principle is the experiencing the love of God. Experiencing the love of God. Well, what does that mean? Well, let's look at our text. This is a very confusing couple verses. It's found in John, 1 John 4, 16 through 18. There's a, there's, there's a lot here, so we're going to read it slow, and we're going to start unpacking it. It says, And we have known and believe the love that God hath to us. God is love. And he that dwelleth in, in love dwelleth in God. We just looked at that. And God in him. Herein is our love made perfect that we may have boldness in the day of judgment because as he is, so are we in this world. We're like him. We have a relationship with him. There's a communication. We're being changed. We have confidence in our assurance of salvation. There is no fear in love. Because, but perfect love casteth out fear, because fear hath torment. He that feareth is not made perfect in love. So when we lack knowledge of God, we miss God's love. When we come to the cross and we're saved, but we never experience the love that God wants to give us in that relationship, we lack what we need, the knowledge, to love Him back. The Hebrew word for knowledge is yada, and in the Greek is gnosis. It is more than general knowledge, it's applied knowledge. So if we don't grow in our Christ-likeness, we don't get knowledge of him, we don't have an intimate relationship with him. And so God says, yes, you came to the cross and, and you humbled yourself based on my word, that Jesus Christ died in your place, but now I want you to experience all of that relationship that I had with Adam in the garden. You know how they walked and talked together? You know how that love was there? How, how intimate it was before sin entered into the garden? God says, I'm going to give you a little bit of that here on earth. I'm going to send trials into your life to help purge out those areas of your life that aren't right. And you're going to walk in the light as I'm in the light. And then when you see my love, you're going to love me back. Because it's going to be real love. Have you ever been hurt by love? Of course you have. All of us have. Because we're so imperfect here. We're so selfish in our love. But all of a sudden, we meet a God that created all things, and he loves us with such purity and such perfectness. And the more knowledge we get of him and we apply it to our life, the experiential 
part of our faith says, wow, he's the real deal. You know what? I can give him my heart. I, I don't have to hold anything back. Hey, I'm a little afraid to give my heart to some people because they might just walk all over it. But I can see in God that he loves me unconditionally and wants to change me to be all that I can be for him. And so I can give my heart to something like that. No matter what it is, I can trust it in his hands because he loves me. Why? The experiential walk changes the old master that was slavish fear, Adam, you know, the Satan, that old master that steal, kill, and destroy. I now have a loving master that wants the best for me. Wow. Wouldn't it be great to have all friends like that? That all he did was pour it into your life for the very, very best? But God says, that's me. And so that's what he wants. He wants us to experience that love. So it would change us. God wants us to understand that intimacy that we can have with him. So as you grow in that love and you see that love and you reciprocate that love, the confidence just keeps building. The assurance of, 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 of salvation is there because you said, hey, I don't care what you say, I walk with him. I remember a lady, lady uh, telling me this. She was going through cancer, and uh, her son was going through a uh, very rebellious time, and, and uh, she was uh, really overwhelmed by all this, and she was going through chemotherapy. She, 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 she is cancer-free now, but at this time, it was very, very difficult. Any of you that have gone through something like that, you understand. And her, all her defenses were down. Her body was hurting. She didn't know if she was going to make it through the cancer treatment. And I was there one day, and she, her son was giving her a bunch of lies. <laughs> and she said to me, I'm very close to God right now. <laughs> I see right through you. Well, she was so close to him, so walking with him, and the love and the exchange and the communication was there. That's what God desires for us, even when we're not going through something. He wants that every day, and if we don't have it, how are we going to be assured of salvation? God loves. God's just. God's holy. But he is love. And he does love us. And these Gnostics, we're, 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 we're teaching them the opposite. So, so God uses his loving chastisement and his trials so we can see that he loves us. This is experiential. So faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. I hear that God died for me. I heard his son died on the cross, was buried and rose again. I believe what I have heard. But now that I am saved, I'm experiencing everything I read. It's real. I, it doesn't matter what anybody else says to me. I know because I've experienced the love of God. And that is what John is trying to tell him. That's how builds uh, faith, this pure love. John says that the fourth principle of growing in assurance in the experience of growing in God's love, our text presents an amazing relationship with God. A living reality in the experience of the true believer. There's two verbs, have known and believe. I know who I have believed in. It's present tense. I know it and I believe. It's present tense. We understood this love before conversion when we heard the gospel that the creator loves us and demonstrated that through his son. And based on hearing the gospel, we understood and believed and depended on Christ alone. And now I am drawing from a new well. See, your life was stuck in a corrupt well, and you were drawing from a master of fear. Always fear, always fear. Lack of confidence, God doesn't love you, you're no good, you'll never accomplish anything, uh, this world's not worth it, it takes away, sucks all the hope out of us. But when we were born again, we, we now are drawing from a new well, we're drawing from God's love, from his strength, from his word. But there's more. John wants us to see in our text, and there's a lot said in these few verses. The, this part of the letter is so packed, it's hard to grasp it all. John is teaching that in the day of judgment, when God will judge the unsaved at the great white throne judgment, that we do not have to have slavish fear because our love is being perfected and made perfect to cast out all future judgments. Now, certainly, when we get raptured, we'll know we'll be at the judgment seat of Christ. There is no great white throne judgment for us. 
We, we are free from that. We've already been judged. But what Satan does is he comes a knocking sometimes and, and puts doubts in our mind if we're saved and that we're going to be at that great white throne judgment maybe one day. Maybe I'm really not saved. See, when we're not living for the Lord and we're not experiencing that love and we don't have that communication, we get distanced from God and we start to believe a lie of this world or wrong theology like they did of the Gnostics and maybe they didn't have all that was needed and then when they did die, they would be at the great white throne judgment and they were fearing. It was a slavish fear. And so, because if you look up that word judgment and I looked up every verse of, of, in the Greek, of that word judgment there, it all has to do with condemnation and departing from God. Everywhere that it talks about the judgment seat of Christ, it's a whole different word. So he's not talking about the judgment seat of Christ. He's talking about in this life, when you begin to doubt your assurance of salvation, then you don't think you're going to heaven, right? You're, that people that don't that believe you can lose your salvation, they live in fear. Ooh, did I lose my salvation today? Or do I have it? Because then they're in fear and it keeps them in bondage that they're going to be at the, at the great white throne judgment. But he says, listen, in this world, no matter what anybody tells you, you've escaped that judgment. And so, so, so he say that don't allow that fear into your life. It's a slavish fear. Because our love is being perfected, made perfect, casting out all future judgments. The mutual love experienced here on earth with our Lord and Savior is so wonderful. Instead of a slavish fear, there will be an experiential or experience of boldness and openness towards him because of the solid evidence of living personal relationship with him. I know, I know, I know who I may have believed in. And I believe he is able to keep that against that day. Against what day? The day of judgment. He's able to keep that from the day of judgment. So we become more like him, and it proves our relationship with him. So on that future day when the world is judged, I am there because we're going to be everywhere Christ is, so I'm going to be at the great white throne judgment. I stand not to be judged, but a spectator. I'm a spectator there. I've already been judged. My only judgment after death is, a, is, the, uh, is, is, the, great, uh, is the Bema seat, is the judgment seat of Christ which is not anything to fear. And so John is telling them, listen, these Gnostics that have crept in, they're telling you you have to have like this special knowledge, you have, to be, you have to have this and you have to have that and you have to have this. And he said, no, 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 no. The proof is this. Did you trust Christ? Let me ask you something. Did you hear, did you understand the gospel? Just in your own mind, you can answer. Did you understand the gospel? Yeah, I understood it, okay. No, I didn't understand it. Well, then you can't be saved. If you didn't understand it, how can you be saved? But yeah, I understood it. Did you believe it? Yeah, I believe that Jesus Christ died in my place. I believe that he was God's son. He was God. And that he died, came in union with my sin, and was buried. And then, did you depend on him? In other words, did you ask him to be your savior alone for the forgiveness of your sin? If so, then the Bible says, you're on your way to heaven. You will never face a the great white throne judgment. Never! You're in no fear of ever being cast into hell. You, you, you are securing Christ. You don't hold him, he holds you. Get rid of that fear. You can't accomplish what God has for you if you're always in fear that you're going to be at the great white throne judgment. That judgment's been taken care of. It's been appeased by the propitiation of God's love. He's appeased God's wrath by coming into union with your sin. The cross frees us. And so as we're spectators there, because God knows us. He recognizes us. He sees the image of his son penciled upon you. You are my child. Wow, think how cool that's going to be when you get to heaven. Man, there's my child. Oh, I remember. I remember where you were. I remember when my son gave you his imputed righteousness. Come with me. Come into the joy of everlasting life. And some people live in fear. And John says, don't live in fear. You have to have confidence. How do you get that confidence? Well, you, you, you begin to walk with him and walk in the light as he's in the, in the light. And as he begins to change you, let him change you so that you can trust him even more. John is pressing home upon us when we come to faith in Christ alone. God changes that person by the Holy Spirit. You know, the Holy Spirit is not passive. 
by any stretch of the imagination. The Holy Spirit is doing an active work. The Holy Spirit is changing me, sometimes, low, sometimes slower than I want. Sometimes painfully, he crucifying my flesh. It hurts to give up some of those things that our flesh loves. But God is doing it in a loving way, not to hurt you, but to make you all you can be for him. God can't use a dirty vessel. He's got to clean that vessel out. And all of us have some things that we've just created in our life that aren't right. Some of us used to steal. God says don't steal anymore. So he wants to change that. Some of us were uh, habitual liars. Everything we said out of our mouth was a lie. But now that we're saved, God wants to change that. And so he gives us trials and, and puts us through things so that we can see those and, and, and we can see that it's better to tell the truth. The Bible tells us in Ephesians, he that lie, lie no more. He that stole, steal no more. And so those things need to get out of our life. And then we don't ever have fear. If you're under slavish fear, if you're looking at God and saying, oh my goodness, he's getting even with me. He's trying to crush me. Oh my, you got the wrong God. God's a loving God. He's just. He'll change you, but he's loving. So you need that experiential walk, that confidence that I've passed from death unto life. I do not fear because perfect love casteth out all the wrong kinds of fear. So all the marks of grace, John sums up in one word, the love, true love. Aren't you glad it's true love? So he says, it's that true love that casts out fear. John uses the Greek word phobos. That is where we get the word phobia. Anybody have a phobia? Afraid of spiders? Anybody? I'll tell you what, I, I, I hate spiders. Forget it. Spiders. I don't know what your phobia is, but uh, maybe you have a phobia. Uh, maybe you have a phobia of taking a, a bath and being clean. I don't know, but everybody's got phobias. That can mean extreme terror. John is talking about the dreaded fear, the slavish fear, the kind of fear that brings torment and punishment. True children of God, we've already been judged. That's why Paul said in 2 Timothy chapter number 1, verse number 7, For God had not given us the spirit of fear, but of power and of love and a sound mind. The believer does not need to be overcome by fear. Rather, we have all we need in Christ by his spirit to overcome all these fears that Satan tries to give us. Sl slavish fear is unbelief in disguise. Let me say it again. Slavish fear is unbelief in disguise. It's not pleasing to the Lord because his perfect love, as we experience it through obedience, will cast out that love. But can I tell you something? If you're living your own life after you've been saved, you're going to struggle. You're going to struggle with where you are with God. You, you, you're going to get the wrong impressions. There's a book I think Harmony's going through with some of the teenagers, uh, The Lies that uh, women believe or something like that, or I forget the, the actual title of it, the, the lies that um, you know, we believe. And that's what Satan does. He, he, he puts fear back on us when, when, when fear has been removed. See, slavish fear originated in paradise, and it lives in the fruit of disobedience. When they ate the fruit of disobedience, they were put underneath a terrible master. They, they lost their fellowship with God. And, 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 and all of a sudden, let me just show you the instant fear that we see in the garden. I heard thy voice in the garden, and I hid myself because I was naked and afraid, said Adam. See, right away, that, that sin of disobedience, that fruit of disobedience, right away gave fear to man. And God said, how did you know you were naked? How did you know this? And that can even happen to us as believers. But we need to trust in God because the scripture says we love him because he first loved us. We don't need to have slavish fear. Anybody who tries to put you back into bondage, run. You are free in Christ. Praise God. And he's changing you to be what you need to be in this walk. We don't need to have that fear that has to do with punishment. Christ already bore our punishment. The punishment had to come. But the punishment fell upon Jesus. The punishment is paid in full for those that are born again. Therefore, there is no condemnation to them that are in Christ Jesus. So God's love in Christ. That we have experiences and assurance. We don't fear like the world. 
Love is the only force in all the world that is greater than fear. Aren't you glad? God's love perfected in you cast out all fear you have about the future and the present and even the past. Don't fear about your past. It's under the blood. Let it go. Don't bring it up again. It's done. It's forgiven. It's gone. He chooses not to remember it anymore and, and live in the present and walk in the light and, and experience that love. And then the future, it's taken care of. Praise God. <laughs> we have a home in heaven. We don't have to worry about that. God has already paved the way. Because that perfect love cast out all those weird phobias that are out there. That's what love does. The problem is, is we've just never experienced love like that. Where do you find love like that? You can't find it here on earth. You can't find it in one of us. Because all of our love is tainted in certain spots, and we're not always all we should be. We're critical, aren't we? We are. We're just critical at times. But God's love is pure. It's real. It's the way God intended it. It's agape love. It's changing love. And his son bore that love on the cross for us. So as we bring this to a close, we won't be able to look at uh, any more. But, but the punishment is, is taken away. But the fear comes when I gaze away from the cross. When, 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 when I'm walking, but I decide to live my own life. And, and, and I walk this way, and I walk this way, and, and, and then Christianity seems old and outdated, and, and we forget that we were purged from our own sins, and we struggle, and we get into that fear that, that God's out, and he's going to send a lightning bolt to hit me. That's just, where, where's that from? Give me the chapter and verse on that. No, God is wooing you back to him through loving chastisement when we are rebellious, and guess what? When we're not rebellious, he sends trials into our life to make us even more of what we could be in him. Man, let me tell you something. That's having your cake and ice cream. My mom said you can't have both. Well, you can in God. You can have your cake and the ice cream because God loves and he's just and he's holy. And so what happens is you become Christ-like because you love. You know what? Do I really, I mean, is stealing really that important to me? Having a bad attitude, is it really that important? Holding on to my bitterness, is it really worth it? Is it really worth digging up the past over and over again and, and believing those lies that those mistakes I made can never be atoned for? Let them go! They're under the blood. Move forward. Don't do them anymore. Go and sin no more, was the cry of the master as he wrote in the ground something that so radically changed every person that was there that they dropped their rocks. And Jesus said, neither do I condemn thee. Where are thy condemners? Neither do I condemn thee. Go and sin no more. So don't step out of the light. John says we get our assurance when love comes into our life, the God who is love wins us and woos us and conquers us and reshapes us by that love. John, John, John loves. John says love, it's like a bottomless ocean. So we got to bathe in that love and experience it and wash away all our fears. Now, those fears diminish slowly sometimes. Because sometimes they're so entrenched in us. Somebody tells you something, and you believe it, and you believe it was from the Bible, and you find out it wasn't. It takes a while for that to come back out. There's a lot of hurt in Christianity because the Bible is misrepresentative, or, it is, or we add to the law, or we add to grace. So 1 John 4, 18, as we close, says simply this. There is no fear in love, but perfect love casteth out fear, because fear have tormented. Fear has torment. There's no, in real fear, there's no torment. There's like a joy. He that feareth is not made perfect in love. So here it is. If you have a lot of fear, slavish fear, you're either not saved or you're carnal 
or you're just very immature and you need to grow and believe what God says. So I don't know what three classes there. Maybe you're not saved. Maybe you're saved, but you're just not growing and you're living your own life and so you're always going to be chasing your tail. Or you are believing God and you are experiencing God's love and you've put the past behind. Bury it. God did. Don't go fishing there anymore. Leave that stuff in the grave. Let it stink and rot. And go forward in God, in the love that he's designed. And God will, will use you afresh and powerfully to make a difference in many people's lives. We all have a past. Anybody here not have a past? Anybody here want us to open up your closet and let us see it all? No, of course not. God has chosen not to remember them. Don't you remember them anymore either. Let those scars heal and move forward. Move forward. If it's been dealt with, of course. You understand that. So here's the invitation. You say, well, what's an invitation? An invitation is how will you respond to the gospel? Maybe you're here today and you're not saved. You do not know Jesus Christ your Savior. Everybody thinks you're saved, but you're not. You've never come to the cross and admitted that you were a sinner and Christ was the only answer, and you need to be saved today. Come. Trust Christ as your Savior. Uh, understand the gospel. Second is, is that you are saved, but you're not growing at all. You haven't grown much since you've gotten saved and you're all twisted up and you got a wrong view of God and you got a wrong view of life and it's messing with you and it's bringing a lot of fear and you're just living in fear. Well, let's get that right. Just say, God, I haven't been growing like I should. I need to start growing. Help me to grow. Help me to get mentored. Help me to get in discipleship. Help me somehow and God will bring the right person to come alongside you. If we can help, let us know. And then the third is you are doing right. And those fears are getting less and less. Keep on. Anything that's been put into your life that is slavish, get rid of it. Don't be brought, be brought back into enslaved uh, wrong thinking again. Don't do it. Don't do it. So Miss Eve is going to come. We're so thankful for her. And she is going to uh, play. And it's not to get you emotionally stirred. You need to respond to whatever the Holy Spirit has said to you in your heart according to his word. He always speaks through his word. And so maybe you're here today and you know you're living in a lot of fear. Let's talk after service. Let's get together. Let's, 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 let's talk about it and see if we can move forward. And if you're not saved, would you come either now or right after service and say, hey, listen, I'm not saved. I know I'm not saved. I need to be saved. Would you show me from the scriptures how I can know that I'm born again? And then can we just rejoice as a church for what we saw today with one of our families. And there are pockets of grace all over this auditorium. I'm looking at all these pockets of grace. Every one of you have a wonderful story of grace. You're all trophies of grace, every one of you. And we got to see a little bit of that today. Praise God, praise God. Somebody said to me once, how come you don't pass offering plates? Well, we should give, right? It's part of the Christian experience. We just kind of put it back there and people just give. Because God's moving in their hearts. And, 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 and you want to be mentored, you need discipleship. That's what we're here for, to make and mature disciples. We're glad how God has provided for this church. So as Miss Eve plays, you do business with God. Close your eyes if you want, bow your head, come forward, come speak to me. Uh, journal, read the Bible, whatever it is. But you make the decision that needs to be made.
That's good. Thank you. Father, thank you for the Lord Jesus Christ. Thank you for your word. What will we do without it? Thank you that we can have clarity of the scriptures by looking at them carefully. Thank you for the Holy Spirit that lives within us. Thank you for the confidence we can have. So we do pray for one another as we depart from here and we have the challenges of the week, which we will. We'll be challenged financially, emotionally, physically. There'll be great joys. There'll be times of great rejoicing, times of great happiness this week. All kinds of things will take place. And Father, we're glad that we can trust you in every one of them. We pray in Christ's name. Amen. So if you get a chance, uh, meet James and his family. They don't live too far from here. They might be moving soon. And uh, his daughter just graduated from high school and is going to go off to college. And uh, that's exciting times for them. Make sure you get a chance to meet them. And his wife must be in the back. And then uh, make sure you take time. If you don't know Danny and Tori and her friend now that we've got to meet, I said, I met you once. And I said, how old's your son? She said, two and a half. It's two and a half years ago because she was pregnant when I met her. And so it's been that long since I've seen her. But greet them and uh, get to know them. And they're part of this body. They're part of this family. They are making a difference. And so we're so thankful for that. All righty. Well, you are dismissed. Oh, sorry. sorry. One more thing. I'm sorry. sorry. Uh, not to drag on the Play that backwards. Longer. I'm sorry, this is okay. Um, we just have a few quick announcements. We try to not have them during the, the middle of the service because we want to focus on what the Holy Spirit is trying to tell us. But, but, but we, we have our, our bulletins and we have our, our slides. But I just want to remind you of a few things that are coming up here at Faithway, specifically this week, or a couple events. If you are interested, there, we have Coon Creek coming up. And there are two things you can help out with. If you'd like to help out with our booth, Please uh, let me or Pastor know we make balloon animals. We try to have conversations with folks who come by. Please let us know if you'd like to be a part of the booth, and we'd be happy to have you. Um, and then we also have our parade next Sunday. So we have a sign-up sheet on the back because in our parade, we, as many of you know, we pass out water bottles. We pass out flyers that, that emphasize our children and teens clubs. And we pass out candy as well. It's a great time, and, and we could use as many helpers as possible next week. And we also ask that you would sign up because we're going to have a meal for the helpers, for anyone that's helping in, our, in the parade. The next, next week's service is a little bit shorter than normal, but we will probably end around 11. We'll have a little meal here for those helping, and then if you're able to sign up, that'd be a great help to us. Um, we also have um, a few more things coming up. We have Baptism Sunday coming up September 11th, and we're very excited for that. If you have questions about baptism, or if you have not been baptized and would be interested in getting baptized, please talk to one of us about that. Um, we may be talking to you about it if we know you've accepted Christ and are interested in baptism, um, but that is coming up September 11th, and another activity coming up is in September as well. We are having a family day, a family activity, an activity for the whole family. We're going up to Crystal Lake area and close to the Wisconsin border to the largest corn maze in the world, and uh, it's not that far from us, and, uh, and we are, as a church, going up. We're all taking our cars, and it's going to be a wonderful family day, uh, just a great day to spend with the family. Um, we are going to go up. It opens at 10. It's called Richardson's Adventure Farm. And we have a sign-up sheet on the back for that as well, Richardson Adventure Farm. And that uh, farm um, is, is a huge corn maze. They have so many other activities for the children as well. And they open at 10 a.m. on Saturday. So you could get there right at 10, um, and you could stay as long as you'd like. They, they're open until 11 p.m. <laughs> but, um, but many of you probably come for lunch. We like to eat lunch together as a church if you're able to come, maybe with your family. And, um, and that, it's just going to be a really fun day. That's September 24th. September 24th. So if you're able to make that, it's $10 per person. Um, and it's faith, that's Faithways cost, and there's a $30 cap per family. That means the max any family will pay is $30. And so if you're interested or available that day, um, really consider coming out. It's going to be a really awesome time with the church. And so um, the final one is not as big, but just also if you're interested in, in singing special music, um, please let me know. Maybe you like to sing, or maybe you, you've wondered if it would be possible for you to sing a special uh, uh, solo or a duet or a group, and uh, just let me know because we'd be happy to, to organize that and plan it, and we wouldn't 
put you next Sunday, but we might get it uh, somewhere down the road. So um, thank you folks for listening, and you are dismissed. Thank you.